on Y News. The PNP CIDG recommends the inclusion of resigned PNP Chief Oscar Albayalde in a criminal complaint for his alleged involvement in the anomalous Pampanga drug raid six years ago. The Philippine National Police places all its key officials on probation for three months following President Rodrigo Duterte's order for a massive reshuffling of positions. The PNP says they will not conduct a separate investigation on the missing reward money in the Batokabesle case. Malacanang defends the backlash of Duterte supporters against the cheer performance of a student group in the University of the, Vis of the Philippines, Visayas. And know why the original Bicol Express train is still beneficial for many commuters despite its rusty look. Good evening. The Philippine National Police Criminal Investigation and Detection Group or PNPCIDG files an amended referral complaint at the Department of Justice concerning the case of the 2013 Agaw Bato incident. The CIDG has included in the amended complaint resigned PNP Chief Oscar Albayalde as one of the respondents. April Senadoza reports why. There is now a total of 14 respondents who allegedly violated Republic Act 9165 or the Comprehensive Dangerous Drugs Act of 2002, Anti-Craft and Corrupt Practices Act, Qualified Bribery and Perjury. Section 27 of Article 2 of Republic Act 9165 and Section 3, Paragraph E of RA Number 3019. The complaint is against uh, Police General Oscar Albayalde and the original 13. On this, Albayalde has a short response in a text message saying he will be accorded due process. According to the PNP CIDG, Albayalde's interference in the delayed execution of the dismissal order on the so called Ninja Cops shows indication of liability. Uh, there is no strong uh, single evidence, no? yung uh, circumstances lang naman uh, uh, that will show that uh, he is probably uh, liable, probably liable. Mm -hmm. sa kasama rin dun sa, of course, yung mga admission sa Senate uh, investigation. Alba Yalde was the Pampanga Police Provincial Director when the drug raid in 2013 occurred. The group of police major Rodney Baloyo are accused of planting evidence and recycling seized illegal drugs from a suspected drug lord, Johnson Lee in Mexico, Pampanga. Baloyo yet again was a no-show in the Justice Department's second preliminary probe on their case. He is currently detained in the new Bolibid prison in Muntinlupa City after the Senate cited him in contempt for being evasive. Meanwhile, the palace distances itself following the move of PNPCIDG regarding Albayalde. We're very sad to be said if they feel that they have a case against anyone, then they can file it and let the law take its course. April Senedoza, UNTV News and Rescue, Manila. Three of the 13 ninja cops tagged in the Pampanga drug raid in 2013 have already been dismissed from service due to their involvement in another drug raid in Antipolo Rizal last May. Arlene Delgado has more details in this report. Five months after the controversial drug raid in Antipolo Rizal in May, six of the seven policemen involved in the operation have been dismissed. Among the six dismissed cops, three are also accused in the Ago Bato incident in Pampanga in 2013, which involves 13 cops originally. 
Those are Police Master Sergeant Donald Roque, Police Master Sergeant Romel Vital, and Police Corporal Romeo Encarnacion Guerrero Jr. Meanwhile, PNP officer in charge, Police Lieutenant General Archie Gamboa, has returned the case of Police Lieutenant Joven de Guzman to the PNP Internal Affairs Service. De Guzman is also involved in both controversial drug raids. De Guzman has been sanctioned with a 59-day suspension for lesser grave charges, but the PNP OIC wants him dismissed from service. We cannot close our eyes. Kasi nandun mismo sa ebidensya eh. Sa course ng investigation, lumalabas, Hindi, may mas malaki kang kasananan. That's why it is remanded back to IAS. Gamboa adds the dismissed policemen can still file a motion for reconsideration as part of due process. The PNP leaves it to the Department of Justice to build up the case and file criminal charges against the accused policemen and the National Police Commission or DAPLCOM for the development of an administrative case. Gamboa assures they will abide by the outcome of the DOJ's investigation on the anomalous 2013 Pampanga drug raid. Harleen Delgado, UNTV News and Rescue Camp Krame. The PNP leadership has implemented a major revamp among its top officials. Malacanang, for its part, says President Rodrigo Duterte is in favor of the move. Harleen Delgado tells us why. PNP OIC Police Lieutenant General Archie Gamboa announced today a major revamp of the Philippine National Police or PNP's top officials. All key positions are under probation for three months and all promotions will be on hold. According to Gamboa, among the factors for the revamp was the directive of President Rodrigo Duterte during their command conference last week and the performance review of the officials amid the Ninja Cops controversy that has shaken the organization. So I'm also giving a chance to other officers to perform. That's why we a fresh idea, fresh start, and then we'll see what you will do in the next three months. Among the reshuffled officials are Criminal Investigation and Detection Group or CIDD Chief, Police Major General Amador Corpuz, who is the new Director of the PNP Human Resource and Doctrine Development, Police Brigadier General Gennardo Carlos as the Acting Director of the Highway Patrol Group or HPG, former Manila Police District or MPD Chief, Police Brigadier General Vicente Dano Jr. as the new Chief of the Calabarzon Police and Police Brigadier General Rodel Sermonia as Deputy Director of Directorate for Police Community Relations. Gomboa assures top officials who will fail to perform their duties will be held responsible. According to Malacanang, the revamp is for the good of the entire police organization. Any revamp will always be good for an organization after a while because may hirap yung ang kakaroon ka na ng ugat doon sa mga posisyon ninyo. Tama lang yun. Harleen Delgado, UNTV News and Rescue Camp Krame. Emmanuel Judavar, the witness in the Batokabe Slay case, has feelings of resentment towards the Philippine National Police. Meanwhile, the PNP maintains there will be no separate investigation in their part on the allegedly missing reward money for the witness. Lea Ilagan details why. The Philippine National Police will not conduct a separate investigation to probe the allegedly missing reward money in the Batokabe Slay case. PNP OIC Police Lieutenant General Archie Gamboa says there is no need for the PNP to investigate because the House of Representatives is planning on conducting a congressional inquiry on the issue. According to Gamboa, they have explained the issue of the reward money to the members of the lower house. The attention of the PNP was called. You know, and we were able to talk to the um, members of the House of Presidents representative who had a query on that. You know, and I think we have rightfully answered their questions. The PNP OIC says they are also willing to cooperate if the Congress will pursue their probe. Should they pursue... Uh, a house inquiry, then the PNP will cooperate. Emmanuel Judavar, a witness in the case, says 
he has feelings of resentment towards the PNP. He says he is now being ignored by the police on the reward money issue after he helped them solve the killing of a Cubicol party list representative Rudel Batucabe and his police escort. Yung paglantad ko talaga, gusto ko talaga mabigyan ng tatarungan yung mga namatay, mga namatay. Kasi kung hindi ako lumabas, baka mayroon pang ibang mga ibang mangyari, hindi maganda. Because of this, he is also asking his lawyer to talk to the legal counsel of a Cubicle Party List representative, Alfredo Garbin Jr. regarding the issue. Gusto rin namin makausap si Congressman Garbin tungkol dito kung ano ang maganda gawin dito. Kasi gusto, lang, gusto ko lang talaga, gusto lang talaga namin na magkaroon ng, magkaroon ng magandang para sa pamilya ko yung hindi kami mabihirap. Kahit konti lang. Judavar has earlier said he received only 6 million pesos of the 35 million peso reward money intended for the informant in the case. Last week, he received 300,000 pesos of the 2 million pesos reward from the Albay Provincial Government. Leia Ilagan, UNTV, News and Rescue, Kang Krame. Old but reliable, this is how some Philippine National Railways or PNR passengers in Bicol describe their trip using the train. Alan Manansala tells us why. If the commuters in Camarines or Province were asked, they still prefer to ride the train. By riding the train, they say they can save money as fares in other modes of transportation are increasing. I tried to ride the train in Naga City. Here, commuters have complaints different from those of MRT and LRT passengers. They say it's too hot on the train. And because there's only one set of train with two couches flying every day, it is inevitable for some passengers to stand their entire trip. But it's okay because it's still beneficial to ride this train. This train ferries passengers from Naga City to Sipokot, Camarines Sur. From Naga City to Sipokot, there are three stations and eight substations. For Larry Bilarde, who travels from Libmanan to Naga City, it's more convenient to take the train than a jeepney. Mas mabilis kisa sa sakay ka ng jeep. Yung ginokonsum namin mga 30 minutes sa jeep, dito mga 15 minutes lang. Lalo na pag uh, maalis sa oras. While for Jose Garcilla, who works as a teacher, prefers to ride a bus or van from Naga City to Sipokot, especially when he wants to arrive at his work's place much earlier. He says it's more comfortable to ride a van. It's okay lang, kasi comfortable ka naman. Makan mong problema ng isil ko na mainit or whatever. This train travels three times every day with approximately 1,500 daily passengers. It's noticeable that each coach is old. Each set of trains is 15 years old. Despite this, Philippine National Railways or PNR Bicol says it's safe to ride train. Oo naman. Oo. Iniingatan talaga namin na <laughs> wag masira. Pag nakit, nakitang kwan, gawa kagad. Antonio Barre, the OIC of the PNR Bicol Operation Department says they are not certain if there's budget allotted for a new set of trains. Pero sabi may darating daw na mga bagong kotse, bagong mga sabi lang. Hindi pa kasi kung nakakapunta ng Maynila eh. Pero walang date certain calendar? Wala pa. Wala pa. Last month, PNR operations engineers conducted an inspection from Tutuban to Naga City lasted for 12 hours and 44 minutes. The Department of Transportation will focus on adding railway and trains next year until President Duterte's turns ends. 
The DOTR has proposed a 106.7 billion peso budget for the new railroads and trains. The Bico line is included in the budget allocation. From 77 kilometers of railroads in 2016, the DOTR plans to make it 1,144 kilometers by 2020. Alan Manansala, UNTV News and Rescue, Naga City. Malakanyang PSC Kamao, the AFP Cavaliers, and the PITC Global Trade Traders strengthened their standings in the first round elimination of the UNTV Cup Season 8. Meanwhile, the PNP Responders is on the brink of getting eliminated early this season. Bernard Dadis details why. PITC Global Traders dominated SSS Kabalika. With this win, PITC's chance to advance to the second round eliminations just got better. Kabalikat, on the other hand, which has three losses and no win, could get eliminated. In the second game, Depending champion AAB Cavaliers defeated the DA Foodmasters and maintained an unblemished 4 0 win loss record. The Foodmasters led in the first half of the game, but with Wilfred Gasulia Jr. and Boyet Bautista's offense, the Cavaliers edged to a double digit win. And in the main game, Malacanang PSC Kamao defeated the PNP responders 75-64. Despite all of the sniper meeping's 29 points and 6 rebounds, the Cubs' efforts could not match Kamao's defense. Uh, sabi ko, uh, more effort sa defense, lalo-lalo na. Sabi ko, ayun ang magpapanalo sa atin yung defense ang yan. Joseph Roque and Jeffrey Punzalan made combined 35 points that made them the best players of the game. Uh, sinusuklihan lang namin kung anong binibigay na playing time sa amin at uh, tiwala. Uh, una, pasalamat ka sa Diyos sa uh, binibigay niyang lakas. Saka, uh, Coach Louie, Coach Rapi, saka si Coach Tani Gonzalez. Talagang uh, malaking influence niya sa amin. This is Kamao's fourth win while the PNP remains at the bottom of Group B with zero win and three losses. The responders have to play two more games in the first round of eliminations while Malacanang is left with one. Bernard Dalis, UNTV News and Rescue, Philippines. Welcome back to Why News. We pick up to where Angelo Castro III left off. I'm Alex Baltazar and here are the headlines. Members of Senate to pay tribute to the late former Senate President Aquilino Nene Pimentel Jr. The Department of Transportation clarifies it has not allowed the operation of new motorcycle firm Joyride in the country. An arrested Iranian beauty queen seeks asylum in the Philippines. President Rodrigo Duterte visits Japan for the fourth time to attend the enthronement ceremony of Japanese Emperor Naruhito. And palm prices to go down this week. Good evening. Former Senate President Aquilino Nene Pimentel Jr. passed away at 85. For his family and fellow members of the Consultative Committee which drafted the federal constitution, Tatay Nene left big shoes to fill as they vowed to continue, pushing for the reforms he initiated. From the gig city, Maya Bermudez will tell us why live. Yes, Mai? Alex, a true statesman and a nation's loss. These are the words echoed by the family, friends, and colleagues of late Senator Aquilino Nene Pimentel. And for several personalities that we have talked to earlier, he was not just an ordinary lawmaker, but a true federalism advocate and a human rights defender. Mrs. Lourdes Bing de la Liana never left her husband, late former Senate President Nene Pimentel, until his last breath. According to the former lawmaker's wife, before Tatay Nene died, he even remembered his deceased mother. Kung noon, advance, itong advance ng mga 
medical equipment ay present at that time when his mom was dying. Sana, sabi niya, siguro si mama would have lived longer. So he was always thinking of others, not himself. The late senator may be called with different titles, but for Mrs. Lourdes, Tatay Nene is best described as the perfect husband. For my standard, he was a perfect, perfect husband to me, not a perfect father to my children. But as a public servant, you define him as you see him. Meanwhile, several personalities, including Tatay Nena's colleagues and friends in politics, visited his wake today and recount his perk and love for the country. So I was reminded of him that he was passionately advocating for federalism. So we tried our luck. We asked him if he could uh, uh, be a guest at the forum. And uh, Chief Justice Davide was going to speak uh, not in favor of federalism and he was going to favor federalism. So fortunately he did consent to be a guest. But you know, he was always apologetic. I, maybe I cannot come on time because I have this uh, program and all that. We're friends and uh, I am very happy that he's recognized by people and by those who do not know him because he deserves a real compliment for the things that he has done. Another great Filipino gun, no. Senator Pimentel. He was my professor in the law school, a professor in evidence, good professor, strict, friendly but very strict to students. Every time na nasa session kami, kahit uh, umabot ng alas 8, alas 9 ng gabi yung aming uh, uh, session sa Senado, kahit boring na yung mga pinag-uusapan, hindi siya umaalis. Talagang uh, hands-on siya sa pagiging uh, minor minority floor leader. He was consistent, uh, dedicated, and uh, very serious. And uh, I think uh, we are going to be similar. Before the 2019 elections, we sat down uh, in 2018. And sabi, niya, sabi lang niya sa akin, Erin, alam mo naman yung, yung odds, no? Eh, one, basta laban. Earlier today, we saw former Chief Justice Hilario Davide, former Quezon City Mayor Herbert Bautista, 2010 presidential candidate Gibot Yodoro. We've also seen Labor Secretary Silvestre Bello III and former House Speaker Pantaleon Alvarez. Earlier, another mass was held here at the Heritage Memorial Park in Taguig City. Executive Secretary Salvador Medial Dea said earlier that President Rodrigo Duterte might visit Tatay Nene's wake on Wednesday. Back to you, Alex. Thank you, Maya Bermudez, reporting live from the Gig City. Senators remember departed former Senator Aquilino Nene Pimentel Jr. as a mentor and defender of democracy. A resolution will be presented to the former Senate President as the lawmaker paid tribute to him on Wednesday. Nel Maribohok explains why. For Senator Ralph Recto, many laws have been enriched by the wisdom of former Senate President Aquilino Nene Kilinging Pimentel Jr. He served as a watchman in Senate and guarded the interests of Filipinos. Senator Laila Dilima describes Pimentel as a defender of democracy. For the lady senator, Pimentel will be remembered for how he fought the martial law dictatorship. Senator Riz Antevero says Tatay Pimentel was one of the greatest defenders of freedom and democracy that can never be filled. Senator Nancy Binay says her father and Pimentel were together for decades in fighting dictatorship. A mentor, lawmakers, lawmaker. This House Senator Sunny Angara describes Pimentel as he authored many laws which became disruptors for the greater good, like giving powers to the local government. Senator Grace Poe believes the former lawmaker was a principled leader and patriot. Senate Minority Leader Senator Franklin Drilon considered Pimentel as his friend, a champion of democracy, human rights, and local governance. Pimentel serves as an inspiration for him, says Senator Joel Villanueva, 
Senator Panfilo Lacson remembers Pimentel as his first minority leader and called his attention to respond to criticisms in 2001. From being a mayor to becoming a lawmaker, Nene was a dedicated public servant, according to Senator Richard Gordon. A loyal opposition of his father, this is how Senator Aimee Marcos described Pimentel, a great Filipino far beyond politics. Senator Christopher Bongo considers Pimentel as a loyal ally of President Rodrigo Duterte from the time he was a Davao City Mayor. The senators will pay tribute to the departed former Senate President. Senator Vicente Soto III, together with the current and former senators, will receive the remains of Pimentel. Senator Soto will present a resolution to Pimentel's family expressing Senate sympathy and condolence over the former Senate President's passing. Nel Maribuho, UNTV News and Rescue, Taguig City. A big loss. This is how former Senator Rene Saguisag describes the passing of Aquilino Nene Pimentel Jr., who was dis disciplined, principled, and courageous lawmaker. Ray Pelayo tells us why. Nene, very honest. Talaga integrity, walang bahid. This is how former Senator Rene Saguisag illustrates former Senator Aquilino Nene Pimentel Jr. The two former public officials both won the senatorial race in 1987. Some of the popular legislations authored by Nene was the Local Government Code, the Philippines Sports Commission Act, and the creation of the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao or ARMM. He co-authored the Generic Drugs Act and the creation of the Philippine National Police under the Department of the Interior and Local Government or DILG. Pimentel and Sagisag were among the Magnificent Twelve who opposed the extension of the U.S. military base in the Philippines on September 16, 1991. So very pleasant memories, talagang freedom fighter, very courageous, very principled. According to Sagisag, there's a big difference between the characters of lawmakers during their time and the present. And then your membership talagang we were also focused on working for the welfare of the people and the marami sideline dito, sideline doon, ginagawang parang hobby o libangan lamang ang Senado. For the former senator, in the present time, poverty has something to do with the kind of politicians elected in public office when votes are sold by some individuals who satisfy their basic needs. Well, I, ako yung nanalo halimbawa no 1987, kahit siyang kusing wala akong ginastos at dinala ako ng tao. According to political analyst Professor Edmund Tayao, voters change preferences as to whom they want to lead them. Ngayon kahit na artist na ka, hindi ibig sabihin mananalo ka ka ka, di ba? Mm. Kasi natuto nga ang potante na hindi pala porke artista, hindi pala porke abogado, hindi pala porke ekonomista. Eh, Magaling at uh, siguradong meron tayong makikita ang uh, uh, wish o kumbaga kakayanan. Sagisag says anyone can be a senator provided they are focused on their profession. Walang masama nun eh. But they should focus. Hindi pwedeng two movies. Uh, paano kung magkakapanahon nyo na basahin ng budget halimbawa kung ganito ko kapal? Ray Pelayo. UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. Malacanang defends the Duterte supporters who criticized the viral cheer against the administration. The palace says their reaction to the performance is just normal. Rosalie Cos explains why. Performance of the University of the Philippines Visayas or UPV students in an annual cheering competition has gone viral on social media. The cheer of the skimmers, an academic organization in UPV, won the competition. The performance was about various social issues hounding the Duterte administration, including the red tagging of the UP students, proposed mandatory reserve officers training corps or ROTC, as well as the maritime dispute in the West Philippine Sea. The 
The cheering performance has been criticized on social media by the Duterte administration supporters. Part of it was uploaded and posted on a social media page of Overseas Workers Welfare Administration or OWA Deputy Administrator Boca Uson. Malacanang for its part defends the reactions of the Duterte supporters. Sir, what can you say to uh, Duterte supporters who are apparently harassing these students? Eh, siyempre, natural lang yung mag-reaction. Siyempre, dating sa kanila, baka hindi sila nagbibiro. Uh, kunyari, nagbibiro sila, pero talagang binabalata nila si Presidente. That's very natural reaction for support supporters of the President. But the palace does not oppose the said cheer or other forms of criticisms against the administration. But, but as you said, uh, obviously they were joking. It's a free country. They can dish out jokes, criticisms. Rosa Licoza, UNTV News and Rescue, Malacanã. The Department of Transportation says the entry of new motorcycle taxis is not allowed in the Philippines while the government is still deciding on whether to legalize their operation. Zoe Anano tells us why. The six-month pilot test run given by the Department of Transportation or DOTR to Motorcycle Ride Hailing Service ANCAS will end in December. Through the test run, the government will be able to determine if they would allow the operation of motorcycle taxis in the country. In addition to this is the passage of a law by Congress that will legalize the operation of motorcycle taxis as public transportation. According to DOTR Undersecretary for Road Transport, Mark De Leon, the evaluation on the operation of ANCAS is underway. He adds that in the meantime, they are not allowing the entry of new motorcycle taxis in the Philippines. Ayaw natin na napakaraming uh, tatakbong motorcycle taxi apps. Napakahirap kasing mamonitor yan kapag uh, napakarami na nila. And uh, since ine-evaluate pa natin yung uh, road safety uh, uh, effects niyan and uh, uh, motorcycle taxis, napaka talaga prudent lang for the government na ilimit muna natin yung uh, operators ng motorcycle taxis. Despite this, a new motorcycle taxi is set to challenge the operations of Ancas on its official Facebook page. Joyride PH says it has started to accept driver operators who want to apply in the platform. According to its management, a driver operator may earn 1,500 pesos daily, but the company has yet to detail when it is going to be launched in the country. The DOTR explains any vehicles operating as public transportation but have not been approved by the government are considered as colorum. Under the law, colorum vehicles will be penalized with thousands of pesos once they are apprehended. The DOTR explains it understands the need of the public for a better and convenient mode of transportation. But the agency reiterates the importance of the welfare and safety of the commuting public. Uh, again, uh, technical working group uh, recommendation yan, uh, iisa lang muna yung uh, payagan natin for this uh, motorcycle taxis. Kasi for, for example, uh, napaka-importante talaga na magkaroon tayo ng monitoring mechanism. Ano pa talaga yung safety track record ng motorcycle taxi bago natin pa, tuluyang payagan na maging uh, maisa pa tas itong motorcycle taxis. Joan Nalo, UNTV News and Rescue, Kalaokan City. Now that the long holidays are near, motorists will be flocking in major expressways as they take a vacation or spend a holiday with their families and friends. Are motorists aware that our roads are subject to speed limits? Brian Lacanlale has the details in this report. Are you a speed junkie when driving our major expressways? Well, think twice before you step on the gas. Because there are specific speed limits implemented in our expressways according to the Toll Regulatory Board. An 80 km per hour maximum limit is established for trucks and buses, while 100 kph is the maximum for cars. This apply to the North Luzon Expressway or NLEX, Cavite Expressway or Cabitex, and South Luzon Expressway or SLEX. A 100 km per hour maximum limit is established for trucks, buses, and cars in the Subic Clark Tarlac Expressway or SCTEX and Tarlac Pangasinan La Union Expressway or TPLX. The speed limit doesn't refer to the just maximum speed vehicle must run on the roads. There is also a minimum limit which is 60 kph because driving too slow can be just as dangerous as driving too fast. 
According to Anlex Traffic Operations Senior Manager Robin Ignacio, the strict traffic laws want to ensure the safety of the motorists. Dapat ang ating mga motorista ay uh, hindi mainis o matakot dito sa ating batas. Pagkos dapat ito ay sundin nila. At uh, tiyak natin na pag ito ay uh, nasusunod ng lahat ng ating mga motorista, ay sila ay makakapag uh, uh, travel ng mas maayos at mas ligtas uh, para maiwasan po yung uh, disgrasya. Based on data from the NLEX management, they recorded more than 20,000 motorists who violated the speed limit law last year. Sa kabuang ito, uh, masasabi pa rin natin na mas marami pa rin yung mga class 1 na, na mga sasakyan na nag, uh, nag over speeding. A video shot by the UNTV News team shows a motorist who exceeded a speed limit of 100 km per hour on SCTX. All the motorists are not apprehended immediately as the no-contact apprehension policy is in place. Motorists are monitored 24-7 through CCTV cameras. Aside from speeding, the use of seatbelts and overloading are also being monitored. Violators of under-speeding and over-speeding will be penalized with a fine of up to a 2,078 pesos by the Land Transportation Office or LTO. Motorists are reminded to always follow traffic rules, and that is the best way to avoid road accidents. Brian Lacanlali, UNTV, News and Rescue, Philippines. Local prices of petroleum products are set to go down this week. In separate advisories, Chevron Philippines Incorporated, Sea Oil Philippines, and Filipina Shell Petroleum Corporation said they will slash the prices of gasoline by 25 cents per liter, diesel by 10 cents, and kerosene by 25 cents a liter. Phoenix Petroleum, Total, and Petrogas will also implement the same adjustments, excluding kerosene. The price rollback will take effect tomorrow, October 22. The crime rate in the city of Manila has decreased according to Mayor Isko Moreno Dumagoso. The PNP, meanwhile, say they are ready to work with the mayor towards a peaceful and orderly Manila city. Asher Gadapan Jr. reports why. Mayor Isko Moreno Dumagoso thanks the dedication of policemen. Today, he met the new line of leadership of the Manila Police in the City Hall. According to Mayor Isko, the crime rate in the city has gone down due to the intensified implementation of city ordinances by the police headed by outgoing Manila Police District Chief Police Brigadier General Vicente Danao Jr. Bumagsak ang riot namin sa Manila. Second, nababawasan na rin yung mga away kapitbahay, lalo na sa gabi. Dahil may pit namin pinatutupad yung 55-55. Uh, an ordinance prohibiting uh, drinking in public places. Incoming MPD Director, Police Brigadier General Bernabe Balba promises to perform his duty well. I cannot promise everything, but I will do everything that I can para po sa mga constituents natin dito sa City of Manila. Newly appointed NCRPO Chief Police Brigadier General Debold Sinas extends his support to the mayor's campaigns. Dinala ko na po yung lahat na staff ko from 1 to 9. They are here including my command group at saka yung ibang support unit. Of course, to, to ally with you and align with your program. Mayor Isko Moreno vows to work hand-in-hand -hand with the PNP to maintain peace in the city. Asher Kadapan Jr., UNTV News & Rescue, City of Manila. A Davoenya singer composer will move forward to the October monthly finals of the Wishkavery Season 3. The judges picked her original song composition entitled Stories. Mirasola Bugadil tells us why. The Wish Covery Originals Ultimate Weekly Eliminations in the month of October was held last night. Mojo Nova Band from Bacolod amazed the Wish Covery judges through their composition entitled Who We Are. Hitmaker Junji Marcelo says he likes the throwback vibe of Mojo Nova Band's composition. Siyang masarap na 90s feel. May paso kayo ng style na hindi na masyadong ginagamit ngayon. At refreshing na marinig at maka magkaroon ng ganitong kanta sa mga sumali. 
Davawenia folk alternative singer-composer Peniel Rojas, meanwhile, wow the judges with her stories. Evolution of songwriting. I must say, and I was really blown away from the performance. Good job, Peniel. And I'd just like to commend the sincerity, the honesty, the innocence in your performance. Isa to dun eh, sa mga hinaharap ko na sobrang nag-transcend siya sa akin, na-move ako. Searching for love. This is the theme of the Search Party's composition entitled Every Day. But did the judges find in the song a factor to make it into the next level of the competition? Minsan, na in love tayo so much that we just want to write songs of how much in love we are, right? I get it. I have songs like that also. The only thing is, daming songs na ganyan. How are you going to be creative enough to make it different from everybody else? Kit Komiya from the National Capital Region showed the best through Bahag Hari. His song is based on his personal experiences in ghosting, he says. Overall, maganda siya, especially pag hinimay-himay mo. Pero pag pinagsama, uh, parang hindi siya as effective. Boses mo bagay din sa kanta. So why Bahaghari? That is the big question. Overall, I think you are a good songwriter. Uh, kailangan lang sigurong i-tweak siya to perfection. Though the contenders gave their best performances, only one will move on to the October monthly finals. And the judges picked Peniel Rojas, who got an overall score of 92%. Find out next Sunday who among the three Wish Covery hopefuls, Abby Singson, LG Fuentes, and Peniel Rojas, will make it to the grand finals of the third season of the biggest talent search in the country. Wish Covery. Mirasol Abogadil, UNTV News and Rescue. And to complete the most significant news for this day, why news continues, here are the top stories. An Iranian beauty queen arrested at the Ninoy Aquino International Airport last Thursday seeks asylum in the Philippines. She was seized after an international police or Interpol red notice was issued. Nina Armilio reports why. Her life is in danger because of joining several beauty pageants. This is the reason why Iranian beauty queen Bahare Zare Bahari is seeking asylum in the Philippines. She says participating in beauty pageants is against her country's tradition. The Department of Justice has yet to determine whether she's qualified to be granted asylum in the country. According to Justice Secretary Menardo Guevara, their main criterion is the alleged persecution against Bahari in Iran. They will also consider all relevant factors. The Iranian remains in custody of the Bureau of Immigration or BI at the Ninoy Aquino International Airport. The BI arrested Bahari last Thursday upon her arrival at Naiya because of an Interpol red notice for an alleged criminal assault filed in her country. But the assault done to her fellow Iranian allegedly occurred in the Philippines. The DOJ will check whether courts in Iran have jurisdiction on Bahari's case. Bahari managed to post a live video on her social media account when she was arrested by the BI on Thursday. Bahari represented Iran at the 2018 Miss Intercontinental pageant held in Manila. Nina Armilio, UNTV News and Rescue, Philippines. Meanwhile, President Rodrigo Duterte travels to Japan again to attend the enthronement ceremony of Japanese Emperor Naruhito tomorrow. This is the fourth time for the president to visit Japan. Rosalie Koss reports why. President Rodrigo Duterte flew to Japan today. 
Together with other heads of states and other dignitaries, the Philippine Chief Executive will attend the enthronement ceremony of the 59-year-old Japanese Emperor Naruhito tomorrow, October 22. This event is a national holiday in Japan. Ang alam ko, attention ng enthronement, proper, and then we have the Emperor's banquet, banquet, and the Prime Minister's banquet. Yun, yung tatlong yun. Naruhito acceded the throne in May 2019 after his father abdicated because of health reasons. He is the first Japanese emperor to do so in 200 years. The Japanese government has canceled the procession after the enthronement due to the aftermath of Typhoon Hagibis, which hit the country over a week ago. Meanwhile, the palace has not given any details on the delegation as well as the schedule of the Philippine chief executive while he is in Japan. So very, very definitely, it's a lean delegation. President Duterte is set to return to the Philippines on Thursday. According to him, Japan is one of the countries which continue their assistance to the Philippines. Rosa Licoz, UNTV, News and Rescue, Malacanang. And for the news abroad, residents in London were divided over what the United Kingdom's next steps should be regarding Brexit, a day after Prime Minister Boris Johnson's attempts to ratify a withdrawal deal were thwarted by Parliament. Jovic Bermats tells us why. The fractious British Parliament refused to vote on UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson's new Brexit withdrawal deal on Saturday, a move that forced him to seek a third postponement of Britain's departure from the bloc. It had so far been envisaged for October 31st. After the British Parliament refused to endorse Johnson's deal, the Prime Minister sent a letter to the bloc requesting a delay, as required by a law passed earlier by Parliament. On Saturday, scores of protesters marched through the capital demanding a new Brexit referendum. Among them was London resident Gary Kane, who said he found Johnson to be untrustworthy and that he was trying to force his way through a stalemate. I think the man has proved time and time again that he reneges on what he says, what his principles are, um, and it's contrary to the law, as with the um, what we found out about the, the Ben Agreement. He's gone against that as well. Um, I wouldn't trust the man. Others were not keen on the idea of a second vote. My thoughts are that the democracy in this country has died. The, every politician in that house promised to deliver Brexit. They are not doing that. In fact, they're trying to reverse the uh, results of a democratic vote. It was unlikely that the EU's 27 remaining member states would refuse Britain's delay request. Diplomats said on Sunday the bloc would play for time rather than rush to decide, waiting to see how things developed in London next week. Jovic Burmas, UNTV News and Rescue, London, United Kingdom. Australia's biggest media rivals unite to protest against what they say is government secrecy. Meanwhile, five people have died after a garment factory was set ablaze by looters near Chile's capital, Santiago, amid a wave of protests. MJ Pineda has the details. In Chile, Five people were killed on Sunday when a garment factory was torched by looters near Chile's capital, Santiago, bringing the death toll in a wave of unrest to seven as authorities expanded a state of emergency. The military and police used tear gas and water cannon against demonstrators, and a nighttime curfew was imposed in major cities. The unrest sparked by a now suspended metro fare hike has widened to reflect anger over living costs and inequality. President Sebastian Piñera has defended the government's response. Protests continued across the country despite a state of emergency in five regions declared by Mr. Piñera on Friday. Thousands of soldiers and tanks have been sent to the streets of capital and other cities for the first time since 1990 when Chile returned to democracy after the dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet. 
in Indonesia. Indonesian President Joko Widodo was sworn in on Sunday for a second five-year term leading the world's third biggest democracy after an election dominated by economic issues but also the growing influence of conservative Islam. 58-year-old Widodo has pledged to cut red tape and keep building infrastructure to underpin growth in Southeast Asia's largest economy, but also made improving education a top priority to encourage investment and create job for a youthful population of 260 million people. In Australia, Australia's biggest newspaper rivals have made a rare showing of unity by publishing redacted front pages in a protest against press restrictions. The News Corporated Australia and Nine Mast Head of Monday showed black out text beside red stamps marked secret. The protest is aimed at national security laws, which journalists say have stifled reporting and created a culture of secrecy in Australia. The government said it backed press freedom, but no one was above the law. The government believes absolutely in press freedoms in this country, and we have taken steps. We have taken the step to add additional defences into our laws to ensure that journalists, Mr Speaker, can get about their tasks. In fact, Mr Speaker, in protections that exceed that that apply to many others around the country. And those were put in by our government, not those opposite, because I remember when those were in government, the, they sought to gag the press in this country, Mr Speaker. In June, police raids on the Australian Broadcasting Corporation and the home of a news corporated Australia journalist generating a huge backlash. The media organization said the raids had been conducted over articles which had relied on leaks from whistleblowers. One detailed allegations of war crimes, while the other reporters on alleged attempt by a government agency to spy on Australian citizens. MJ Pineda, UNTV News and Rescue. An Australian airline hails achievement after a 19-hour New York to Sydney flight carrying 50 passengers and crew. Nina Bascon has the details. A really historic moment for Australian aviation and a really historic moment for world aviation. Australian airline Qantas landed the world's first ultra-long-haul research flight in Sydney on Sunday. After traveling 16,200 kilometers, or 19 hours and 16 minutes from New York. Just 49 people, including six pilots, six members of cabin crew, including a chef, a handful of reporters, six frequent flyers, and the airline's chief executive, Alan Joyce, were on board the Boeing Dreamliner flight designed to test whether passengers can endure the physical and mental effects of extremely long airplane journeys. This is the first of three test flights that's going to uh, come up with recommendations of uh, how we manage pilot fatigue, how we actually manage passenger jet lag, and after 19 hours on the flight, I think we've gotten this right. The flight was restricted to such a small number of passengers in order to ensure that it was light enough to make it all the way to Australia on one tank of fuel. In order to reduce the weight, strict restrictions were put in place, including limiting passengers' luggage and destocking most of the bar. All the passengers were in business class. Qantas Captain Sean Golding said passengers and staff on board were also fitted with EEGs to monitor brainwave activity with checks on melatonin so that data could be collected with aircraft to be developed to suit the needs of both passengers and staff. We're researching the effects of uh, the, 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 the long flights, the ultra long haul flying on our, on our crews. Uh, we're getting a lot of data that's going to be analysed over the, the coming weeks and months. Joyce added that Qantas were looking at four aircraft classes, with a special area for economy passengers to be able to exercise. Nino Vascon, TV News and Rescue, Australia. And those are the reasons behind the news this October 21st, 2019. On behalf of Alex Baltazar and Angelo Castro III, I am William Theo, and before we close, we will recap with today's significant soundbites. 
Because we need to know, we will always ask why. Good evening. There is no strong uh, single evidence. No? Yung uh, circumstances lang naman uh, that will show that uh, he is probably uh, liable. Probably liable. Mm -hmm. Sa kasama rin dun sa, of course, yung mga admission sa Senate uh, investigation. That's why, reshuffle tayo, a fresh idea, fresh start, and then we'll see what you will do in the next three months. It's a free country. They can dish out jokes, criticisms. For my standard, he was a perfect, perfect husband to me and a perfect father to my children. But as a public servant, you define him as you see him. So I was reminded of him that he was passionately advocating for federalism. Nene, very honest. Talaga integrity, walang bahid.